I'd like to um, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today for our next installment of Aurora Research Institute speaker series. So like we said, we were watching the names pop up and I recognize some and I don't recognize the other ones. So it's really great to see, you know, so many people that have tuned in today and joined us from, it looks like a few in the Northwest Territories and some of them throughout Canada as well. So I want to start, I want to acknowledge, um, I'm up here in Inuvik, Northwest Territories. And in Inuvik, we're on the traditional land of the Gwich'in and Inuvialuit peoples. So we extend our deepest respect and appreciation for sharing this land with us. And we further want to extend our respect to all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples of the North who call this territory home. As part of our mandate, the Aurora Research Institute has been running a virtual speaker series for many, many years. Uh, and like many things, in 2020, we had to adapt and we converted our speaker series to become virtual. And that enabled us to continue sharing research and results and a lot of the exciting things that were happening, you know, not just with our friends in Inuvik, but now with our friends worldwide. So before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping items with everyone, just so everybody is aware of how they can participate in today's webinar. At any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you've got a Q&A and a chat, so you're welcome to click on either of those and you can type your questions into the Q&A or into the chat. Uh, and following the presentation, uh, our friends today will have a chance to answer as many questions as possible. Just wanted to let everybody know that we are recording this webinar and we'll be sharing it on our ARI website and our, our social media channels um, probably tomorrow. And the last thing, if you've uh, been to a couple of our webinars in the past, you know that I love using the poll function. So I'm just going to start. I want to have two questions just to ask of our audience today. So I've launched them now and they should pop up on your screen. We want to know where you're logging in from today. And if you're logging in from somewhere else that I haven't put up there, just type in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from today. And then the second question, we want to know what best describes your role in joining us today. So feel free to check all of the options that apply. And again, if I've missed something, feel free to type in the chat and let, let us know why you joined in today. So I'm just going to leave that up for another second. I can see people voting. Awesome. Yeah, we have a good mix of people coming in from the Northwest Territories and from elsewhere in Canada. Amazing. Oh, and it looks like some people who have also participated in air quality monitoring and research. It's really interesting to see a great diverse audience that joins in. Quite a few Northerners tuning in too, which is awesome. All right, so I am going to end the poll. So thank you guys very much for just answering those two questions for me. And uh, I want to introduce you to our friends today. So we're joined by some friends from Environment and Climate Change Canada. So we've got Haley Hung, uh, Lisa Yontanen, and Sandy Steffen. And they're joined today by Mark Lipton. So the team is going to discuss how contaminants travel in air and in the ocean currents to getting into the Arctic ecosystem and what impacts this has on northerners and the Arctic environment. I just want to just give a quick shout out to you that uh, a lot of the monitoring and research that this team does is supported by our technicians here at ARI, our amazing technicians who are out there doing a lot of monitoring and maintenance of their air monitoring station in Inuvik. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark and the team, and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Um, thank, uh, can you see me? I'm uh, trying to figure out uh, the if I'm host yet and find all of the important things. Sharing, I'm sharing. But can you, can people see me and hear me? Uh, oh, nope. Hi, I'm Mark Lipton from the University of Guelph. Welcome. Um, usually it's our custom to begin with a gift. And if you were in my class, I would give you something sweet like chocolate. Today I have bottle caps, and, um, but I'm not there. So I can't give you my bottle caps. 
How strange is this, by the way, that I can be there and not there at the same time? It's a very strange thing. Uh, and, you know, we're here to talk to you about environmental stewardship using human-made tools. We get that irony. We get that there's something strange going on and we are drawing attention to it because we are all both here and not here. And this leads to an, a second gift um, uh, because it's something that you have with you right now. And I wanna ask you about the air, the air you're breathing. What does today's air feel like? How does the smell of today's air evoke a vivid mental image of another time or another place? Air is life-giving. It is simultaneously present, yet alarmingly nowhere to be seen. And in that spirit of here, not here, I just want to offer a little mini proverb from my culture. I see my culture as meaningfully remixed as Yiddish, Jewish, a little Buddhist, I call myself a Jubu, and I really do sincerely speak to and through my ancestral grandmothers um, all the time. Uh, their epistemic knowledge, their oral histories are in or are my body. And uh, it, in that, I, like, I, it, it helps me find or reveal, it reveals for me this magical kinship with all sentient things and all things on the earth. And in that vein, I can hear my Bobby's voice right now. Bobby Gito, what would she be saying? Let me say that to you one more time. You can't dance at two weddings with one derriere. And yet, Bobby Gito, I am here and not here, simultaneously present, yet alarmingly nowhere to be seen, just like you. Um, and um, we do want to recognize that um, each First Nation possesses shared and individual culture, heritage, languages, and systems of governance. We try to work and live and play with the tension and respect to, um, to the earth and to indigenous uh, stewardship and leadership and feel like what a privilege it is to talk with you today. Um, oh, welcome to Assessing Arctic Air. The state of Arctic's air has arrived at a fork in the road. Both paths lead to massive ecological change. How do you know which path to take? Which path is a trap? Which path may lead to possible solutions? Let's turn to Environment and Climate Change Canada scientists for some answers. Hi, my name is Haley Hung. I'm a research scientist of the Air Quality Processes Research Section of Environment and Climate Change Canada. I study human-made chemicals found in air in sensitive ecological systems, such as the Arctic and the Great Lakes. When Haley travels up north, she loves meeting new people from different communities and listening to their stories about their land and culture. Welcome, Haley. Hi, my name is Lisa Yontanen. I'm a chemist from, also from Environment and Climate Change Canada. We've been researching contaminants in air and water in the Arctic for the last 28 years. Recently, my focus has, look, has me looking towards microplastics and their presence in the Canadian Arctic. I'm also a network investigator with ArcticNet, which you might have heard of. Well, wait a second. Like, if you're doing microplastics, does that mean you're on those like giant Coast Guard tankers for, for collection, collecting samples? Yes, yeah, sure uh, is. That's so cool. <laughs> um, and um, please. Hi, my name is Alexandra Stefan, but everyone calls me Sandy. I'm the lead mercury researcher for the Atmospheric Processes Research Section at Environment and Climate Change Canada as well. I specialize in trying to understand and explain how mercury behaves in the air. I run several mercury sampling programs to understand the levels of mercury in the air on local, regional, and global scale. Sandy, don't stop there. Let's celebrate your recent work at the intersection of science and policy. Sure. Thanks, Mark. I was appointed to the Canadian delegation for the Minimatic Convention on Mercury, where I get to help Canada negotiate our position on the international level when it comes to, uh, when it comes to issues of mercury in the environment. 
Thanks, Sandy. Sandy is most known for her long-term work in the high Arctic and in springtime. You may just see her traipsing across sea ice collecting samples. Um, thank you, Haley, Sandy, and Lisa. And thank you to our audience. All, all, you're all over the place. Um, we welcome you to our talk. We want everyone to feel like they belong here. Thank you, Mark. So the work that we conduct would only happen because of the support from national programs under the Environment and Climate Change Canada, the Northern Contaminants Program, the Chemicals Management Plan, and the Arctic Net, as well as international programs such as the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. We also want to highlight and give a big shout out to our Indigenous communities and partners from many regions of the Canadian Arctic who help us develop and work on our programs. This research is a community effort and continues with your determined support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Today's presentation is organized into four parts. First, we share with you the intensity of science and our work and tell you what we do. Second, we are concerned about contaminants in the Arctic and we tell you why with seven shared reasons for studying Arctic contaminants, and we each describe our concerns in more detail. Three, we answer the question, what is Arctic pollution? And get into details about the specific contaminants that each of us study. We also include some results from this work. And finally, we conclude with ideas about the bigger picture. In our role as scientists, we share a few important ideas about how science can drive social and ecological change. So on to part one, what we do. So I'd like to give you some background about our contaminants work. Sandy, Lisa and I have all worked together in air research for a long time and have almost 75 years experience between us. Many of you already know what air pollution is. We study contaminants, a subsection of pollution. Contaminants refer to potentially harmful toxic substances not normally found in the environment. We study how contaminants that are emitted by human activities get into the air and how they affect the Arctic environment. So our work is primarily under a program called the Northern Contaminants Program, which conducts long-term monitoring and surveillance of chemical pollutants in air and wildlife. We have been measuring persistent organic pollutants, mercury, and more recently, microplastics at many places in the Canadian Arctic. For several years, we have been collecting information from Alert on Ellesmere Island. Alert is the world's most northerly station where these unwanted chemicals are being measured. Since the 1990s, unwanted chemicals are measured at Alert, making Alert the world's longest measurement program of these pollutants. We also monitor another long-term measurement uh, station um, in the Yukon, close to Whitehorse called Little Fox Lake. In 2014, Sandy and I partnered with seven communities where we collect air samples for both persistent organic pollutants and mercury. We collect these pollutants by pulling air through a trap, either with a pump or naturally from the air. Mercury can collect on a trap made of gold or carbon. We conduct a program in the Northwest Territory where we use the carbon type sampler. You may see the little cobalt blue container that looks like a Noxima jar uh, mounted on the pole. That's the carbon type sampler. Uh, that uh, how it looks like when it is mounted. Persistent organic pollutants are a bit different and they are collected on traps made from foam or small plastic beads. In the Northwest Territories, we use the plastic bead sampling traps. This photo is from Fort Resolution. The metal tube is the sampler for persistent organic pollutants. Once samples are collected, they are sent to our labs in Toronto to be analyzed, where we identify the amount of persistent organic pollutants and mercury in the air. Part two, why are we concerned about contaminants in the Arctic? We now share seven important reasons why we study contaminants in the Arctic. One, our planet and all living things exist in a delicate ecological balance. Ecology 
prefers the branch of science concerned with the interrelationship of organisms and their environment. As environmental scientists, we're tasked to look at aspects of the ecological system for patterns and relationships between living and non-living parts of the environment. From this information, we try to assess when the balance of the ecological system is off. We mainly do this by seeing if the level of pollutants in the air are going up or going down. And we'll show you some of these results later. Two, part of the work we do is to track changes of Arctic pollution levels, assess risks to the ecosystem, consider the impacts, and help reduce the future risks. Three, contaminants from around the world travel to the Arctic and gather in the Arctic. These contaminants stay in the Arctic like a bad house guest and do not want to leave. Four, contaminants are toxic and may impact Arctic environments and communities. They are something people don't think about that are also impacted by climate change. Five, contaminants do not degrade easily. In fact, these chemicals may multiply through processes called bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Six, contaminants can impact wildlife and can pose risks within the ecosystem and to the humans. Our last concern, seven, is really our major concern, and it lies in the impact and exposure of contaminants on northern people. Now we're going to tell you a bit more specifically why we're concerned about Arctic contaminants as environmental scientists. Contaminants such as POPs and mercury are toxic chemicals that should not be found in high levels in the Arctic. Microplastics are often found in the Arctic where they shouldn't be there at all. As contaminants travel to the Arctic, they make their way into the ecosystem, into the wildlife, and eventually into the humans. The primary route of exposure is through consumption of country food that contains these contaminants, which can be unhealthy for humans. Our role is to try and understand how the contaminants get to the Arctic and figure out what happens once they get there. Why do we care about persistent organic pollutants or POPs? Actually, we call ourselves POP stars. I have four answers. First, these chemicals can stay in the environment for a long time. Once emitted into the environment, they do not break down easily. It might take hundreds of years. Second, it doesn't matter where POPs or persistent organic pollutants originate from. Wind and water carry, carry these chemicals far from home, eventually taking these pollutants to remote Arctic regions. Third, persistent organic pollutants are toxic. For both wildlife and human, exposure to POPs may result in health problems. And four, my last point, these unwanted chemicals have a tendency to accumulate through the food web. In fact, they are known to accumulate at the top of the food chain. When we study animals like whales and polar bears, higher levels of POPs are found in their systems. Why do we care about plastics? Plastics are everywhere. We are constantly exposed to small little bits of plastics called microplastics. Plastics can have physical effects on animals, especially when animals mistake plastics for food. The plastics make them feel like they've eaten enough. Their bellies are full, but plastics have no nutritional value. Animals sometimes get tangled or stuck in plastics. Imagine what happens to these animals when these animals consume plastics, how it impacts their insides. Plastics are passed up the food chain when small critters eat plastics and then are eaten by fish and then are eaten by seals. Like other contaminants, as plastics pass up the food chain, they can bioaccumulate bio and biomagnify. We just talked about what we do, then we outlined seven specific points and went into greater details about why we care about contaminants in the Arctic. In short, we care because Northern people and our wildlife may be exposed to these contaminants and experience negative effects. Part three. Now we turn to the contaminants and take a look at what we study in more details. Many human activities emit chemicals that contaminate the environment 
things like mercury travel from around the world into the Arctic. That's Sandy's areas of expertise. My area include pesticides, industrial emissions, and commercial chemicals. Every day, humans use chemicals that can also contaminate our environment. Commercial chemicals include, for example, pots and pans treated with nonstick chemicals. Uh, did you know that hamburger wrappers are coated with liquid repellents to prevent juices from soaking through the wrappers? This coating is another commercial chemical. And finally, microplastics are now found everywhere in the environment. In a minute, Lisa will talk about plastics. First, let me tell you about a particular class of chemical that I study called the persistent organic pollutants. Persistent organic pollutants make their way to the Arctic through a process called the grasshopper effect. When these chemicals are emitted in tropical regions, heat and high temperatures make the chemical rise into the atmosphere in the form of gas. Then they piggyback onto wind and travel north. Right now, I'm in Toronto, where the, the climate is temperate, cold in the winter, and hot in the summer. In the winter, persistent organic pollutants fall to the ground and onto the land and ocean surfaces. But when it's hot, they evaporate into the air while wind and air currents take them to the Arctic. The persistent organic pollutants that we study do not occur naturally. They are mostly human-made. There are three main classes of persistent organic pollutants. First, industrial chemicals include things like PCBs, flame hardens, and stain repellents. We can find PCBs in old transformers. Flame retardants are chemicals used on furniture and electronics like in, on your sofa or on your cell phones, preventing fires. And st stain repellents are used in some food packaging, like when I was talking about the hamburger wrapper earlier. Second, pesticides that kill bugs, dead. For example, DDT has killed mosquitoes to help control the spread of diseases like malaria. The, the third class is exhaust. <coughs> Like smoke, when you burn wood, exhaust refers to combustion byproducts. So for example, a, a car engine uh, produces exhaust, what coming out of your car's tailpipe. Finally, I want to look at persistent organic pollutants and some measurements results. These maps illustrate measurements of persistent organic pollutants in air found at five Canadian Arctic communities as compared to Toronto, which is just outside my office. The larger the bars are on the maps, the higher the concentrations. The green bars represent pesticides. These are bug killers. Um, there are more bug killers found in the air in the east than in the west. This is likely a result of more farming out east. Flame retardants are represented with uh, the yellow bars here. It seems like places with more people like Iqaluit and Inuvik have higher concentrations of flame retardants. More people mean more uses of consumer products like furniture and computers. These are coated with flame retardants to prevent them from catching fires. Obviously, large cities like Toronto have the largest amount of flame retardants in air. I just noticed the maps there was they they were all offset a little bit so everything was further north than meant to be it's clear that we like to go north <laughs> oh dear i'm sorry well that's Oops. fine <laughs> so mercury is a little bit of a diff a little bit different than persistent organic pollutants in that mercury is natural in the environment we know from our periodic table that table of the elements that the symbol for mercury is hg or capital H, small g, which stands for hydrogerum or quicksilver. In nature, it's mostly found as a rock with some beautiful redness to it, and that rock is called cinnabar. In some spots, mercury can be found in the ground as a silver liquid. So for when you see a thermometer, one of the older thermometers, it's that silver mercury in there that rises and falls with the temperature. Uh, it rises and falls with the temperature, telling you how cold it is outside. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I know, I just read that <laughs> the chat bit, so <laughs> that's very cute. Um, dentists, sometimes dentists. Use, uh, dentists sometimes use mercury in people's teeth 
such as fillings. It's not a common practice in Canada anymore, but it's done in some countries around the world. I have to admit that I have many mercury fillings in my tea. Mercury can also be distributed to the atmosphere naturally through forest fires, volcanic eruptions, and even comes in and out of the oceans and water systems. Those are the natural forms of mercury. However, mercury is released, released into the atmosphere through anthrop anthropogenic or human activity. In fact, the amount of mercury in the environment has been amplified by at least three to four times since before Industrial Revolution. And this is because of mining activities, metal smelting, the use of mercury in consumer products, coal burning, and artisanal scale gold mining. There's a lot of mercury on our planet. So that's the dichotomy of mercury. It's natural in the environment, but many human and human activities release mercury to the environment that would not otherwise be there. There certainly is more mercury than what there should be. Let me show you some results now from measurements collected in the Canadian Arctic. At this stage, because of COVID-19 we, restrictions, we actually haven't been able to get into our lab to finish the data we've collected for the Passive Air Sampler program. So that's a bit on hold now, but um, the data production is still in process. Once we're back, rest assured, that will be a top priority. Instead, I want to show, I want to address and show you what we've seen at our long-term stations, Alert and Little Fox Lake that Haley described before. We selected these sites because they're good benchmarks for, benchmarks for looking at mercury, particularly mercury that's traveled long distances from its sources. Canada is a net recipient of mercury from outside sources, which means we take in more than we put out. In fact, 95% of the anthropogenic or man-made mercury that deposits in Canada comes from outside of Canada. Part of my role is to keep an eye on the mercury that's coming from these faraway places. Since 1995, when we began measuring mercury at alert, we discovered the levels of mercury in the air have decreased by approximately 1% per year or 25% over the 25 years. This is good news. It's a good news story. We've got the mercury going down. However, when you look at the levels of mercury from Little Fox Lake in the Yukon, we see a 1.3% increase per year or a 16.9% increase over the 13 years that we've been monitoring mercury at Little Fox Lake. The reason we think is that the levels are going up in the west and down in the high north are because of where the primary air comes from. So you see in this figure now, it's a little skewed here, it's a bit off, but you can see in alert, um, there's three arrows going into alert. Um, the air masses are coming from Europe, from North America, from North America, and from Asia. So the air masses from Little Fox Lake are primarily coming from Asia and a little bit from North America. So emissions in Asia are on the rise while semi simultaneously emissions from North America and Europe have been significantly decreasing. So we think the changes we're seeing at these sites reflect the trends of emission sources from the areas they come. Microplastics, what are they? We all know what plastics are and plastics are great. We all use them so much. I can't imagine life without them. The problem is we generally use them once or for a short amount of time and then we throw them away. We try to recycle, but most end up in the landfill, but some in the wider environment. Microplastics are carried by winds and by rivers and oceans, so we find plastics everywhere. We find them in the deepest Arctic sediments. We find them in high elevation mountains. They distribute themselves all over the world. Microplastics are everywhere. We are living in a world polluted with microplastics. These tiny sized microplastics are fibers, fragments, beads, smaller than five millimeters long, which is about half the width of your thumb and smaller. A penny displayed here with tiny microplastics 
helps give us a sense of the relative size. Plastics do break down into smaller pieces, especially in the ocean, but plastics never disappear. They become smaller and smaller pieces, but plastics do not break down chemically, returning to the original form of carbon and hydrogen. Where do microplastics come from? One source is the manufacturing of plastic. Raw plastic materials, often called nurdles, are simple beads of pure plastic. These are sometimes found on beaches and have been referred to as mermaid tears. Other sources of microplastics are the, the result of breakdown of larger plastic debris. For example, the breakdown of polyethylene plastic bags, like your grocery store uses, if your grocery store still uses plastic bags. Plastic fibers released from textiles, either during manufacturing or laundering, are a major source of microplastic pollution. Speaking of laundry, if you've ever played with the fibers from your clothes dryer lint trap, they are full of microplastic fibers. These days, a lot of clothing is made from plastic synthetic fibers, where synthetic materials are combined with cotton. Both materials release a lot of microplastic fibers. A lot of microplastics also go down the drain when you wash your clothing. Plastic fibers released from textiles, either during manufacturing or laundering, are a major source of microplastic pollution. Of course, plastics are never just plastic. I mentioned the manufactured nurdles, but most plastics contain all kinds of other chemicals. Haley mentioned some of these. Plastics contain flame retardants to prevent them from starting on fire. They contain phthalates, which makes the plastic more flexible. They also contain chemical dyes for color and UV filters so the plastic won't fade in the sun. This makes microplastics a chemical soup. Microplastic can also attract other chemicals from the environment. They can pull towards toxic chemicals such as mercury and other metals. How are humans exposed to microplastics? We think of microplastics being in our food, like fish. But no, 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 a recent scientific study, an important review article, discovered that humans are mostly exposed to microplastics through the inhalation of microplastic fibers. It's in the air you're breathing right now. We breathe in these fibers. In fact, a major way microplastics can impact human health is through the air. Microplastics can cause inflammation. However, this is such a new area of science. At the current moment, we do not know the specific human health effects of microplastic inhalation. There's increasingly more work being done, but more research is urgently needed. Part four, how scientists change the world. <laughs> Sandy, you're muted. My apologies, I have airplanes going over. And I did, I did a da 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 like, here I come to save the day. <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> there's a bigger picture to the science work we do. This work is meaningful to us. We are driven to do our research because of what we discover helps drive local and, and global change. Now we'll spend our last few minutes sharing how we participate in social and ecological change. Because we are government scientists, we, produced high, we produce high quality scientific information. Our work also provides important information to governments who use research to guide pollution control and other environmental policies. The scientific method begins with careful observations, in our case, by paying attention to the ways in which the Arctic air may be contaminated. We design experiments about the environment that produce verifiable results. That means that if I wanted to test another scientist's research, I should be able to follow their procedures and arrive at the same factual results. Understanding the facts is, of science is important. And because we are government officials, our facts must make sense to the general public. When Canadians have questions or concerns about the environment, they direct these concerns to their elected officials, call on policymakers to make government rules that we all must follow to protect the environment. 
The facts that come to light because of our scientific research are used to inform global policy communities on the state of the science. The, science, the scientists and the policy folks work together to produce reports. This information is then crafted into national policies or the rules that attempt to reduce pollution in the Canadian environment. As federal government scientists, we're firmly committed and engaged to this process, and it's our job to provide nonpartisan scientific advice to the government of the day. Over the years, our scientific research has provided facts for policymakers in Canada and internationally. Our facts are used to craft rules that protect the environment. And because pollutants are used all over the world, because the pollutants are emitted from all kinds of sources, and because pollutants can be carried by wind and water moving to remote places like the Arctic, it is important that everyone in the world follow these rules that help reduce these chemicals from traveling to the Arctic and harming its environment. Global agreements under the United Nations control and restrict these, these pollutants, including the Stockholm Convention, which controls the production, use, and release of persistent organic pollutants, and the Minamata Convention that controls mercury. Lisa's work now provides scientific information for making regulations about microplastics and plastic waste. Her work will feed into Canada's plastic science agenda and the Ocean Plastics Charter. We provide our nonpartisan science advice to our Canadian government representatives who negotiate with government officials from all over the world. Then global regulations like international laws and agreements are enacted to reduce or remove these pollutants. It takes every human on this planet to follow these rules. We want to prevent harmful pollutants from entering the Arctic and we use our science to protect and preserve the Arctic environments and the people. In closing, we share four big ideas of better work and our concern about contaminants in Arctic air. One, we told you about our work as scientists, what we do. Two, we outlined our concern about Arctic air pollution and shared seven reasons for studying Arctic contaminants. And we each provide additional detail and context. Three, we answer the question, what is Arctic air pollution? And describe the specific contaminants each of us study. And four, we looked at science from a larger frame and shared some important ideas about how science can drive social and eco ecological change. Each of these elements of our work gives us significant opportunity for hope. Change is possible. Change is absolutely possible. Through local engagement, ongoing and additional research, and through policy interventions, science drives change. Science drives change. Science drives science change. Science drives change. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. And I'll just um, share with you our sponsors while you uh, determine if there's any questions or anything you'd like to discuss with our um, panelists. And in that in, in that vein, I will stop sharing and um, uh, 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 see who's with us. <laughs> uh, stop, share. Okay, hi everyone. And I'm gonna put on a gallery to see, oh no, okay. Uh, and there's lots of questions coming in um, from the, the chat. Um, Okay, no, their comments about um, how, how we did, how we did. I um, uh, invite any questions and, um, you know, I have a few questions for you folks. Um, can you explain to me, like, just quickly, how or what the difference is between bioaccumulation and biomagnification? Is, is, is one happen before the other? So biomagnification means that if a contaminant gets into the environment, 
and the little shrimps and algae take up this contaminants and then a small fish eats the algae and eats more algae and more sh little shrimps then it magnifies in the little fish body and then a large fish come about and eat a lot of small fish then all these magnified again and then eventually um, it magnifies to the top of the food chain goes into something like a whale that eats a lot of large fishes then it bio magnified. So by accumulation is a little different. Uh, it means that like if uh, a, a fish gets older, um, they, they, um, they accumulate more contaminants. So it's uh, when you get older, when you eat more food that contain contaminants, then it, the contaminants accumulate in your body and it gets really uh, highly concentrated in you. Is that the same for mercury and uh, microplastics? Does it happen in the same way? Sorry, I have a plane going over. I was trying to wait until the plane, <laughs> the plane went over before I responded. But it's the same thing in, in, with any type of chemical in the ecosystem. Um, biomagnification is, you know, one fish eats another fish, eats another fish, eats a whale, eats a well, seal, I guess a seal would come before then and then, you know, all the way up the food chain, whereas the bioaccumulation is just as you accumulate it over your lifetime. Gotcha. Sort of like the tires I'm accumulating over my lifetime. Oh. Um, microplastic seems to be a little bit different. It doesn't seem to, um, animals seem to be able to clear the microplastics more effectively than the other contaminants. So there's not, a, not quite as um, much bioaccumulation and biomagnification through the food chain. But this is based on very, very limited um, study. Um, so much more work is needed to be done on this a new emerging um, um, part of science. You, you all shared uh, some of your results. And I wonder if you could speak frankly about how COVID has impacted your uh, research practice in the last year, things have changed radically for so many people. What stands out for you? Well, I think in terms of the Northern Contaminants Program research we're doing, the biggest thing has been, for me, is the Passive Air Program because we have not been allowed in our labs. Um, I envy people in the North who have these like uh, get to you know enjoy enjoy the outside we've just gone now in Ontario down to another state of emergency into another four weeks of lockdown so we actually haven't been back to the lab since March last year which means that uh, we couldn't even send out any samples so the samples that people had already had they went through them and then we had a big break now we managed to squeak some stuff in when we opened up a little bit at various spots so we're hoping that Starting in January 2021, we've started to distribute them, but uh, we do have a gap in our data, and that's that's problematic. It's it's a shame. Yeah, the same with me. I do research on the big Coast Guard ships, and they were all canceled this year. So we'll have a big um, um, gap in our data, also. Unfortunately, we were able to get some samples with the help of some um, communities in the Northwest Territories. Um, and uh, so that so that was great, and and Yukon also. So for uh, persistent organic pollutants, uh, we also have similar issues with Sandy. We were not allowed back into our lab, so we cannot produce the sample that will need to be changed. So, but the good thing about persistent organic pollutants is that uh, the sampler that we showed earlier, that is the metal tube with the plastic beads, that sampler is very uh, is capable of uh, staying in, in the field for a long time uh, so that we can continue to collect. So basically this is um, an un unprecedented experiment that we are actually leaving the sampler out in the field for two years. Uh, in order to see uh, what, what chemicals it accumulates in it. So it might give us some interesting, uh, surprising results. So it's a, a little bit of a silver lining in that sense. Um, well, yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's the new frontier, I suppose. Um, a few questions are starting to come in. And this first one is about um, microplastics for Lisa. Um, at, I believe the, the folks understand that persistent organic pollutants and mercury 
travel to the Arctic through the atmosphere. Do plastics travel through the air in the same way? If so, how far? Or is it all via oceans and rivers? Could you answer that, Lisa? So um, plastics do travel through the air. And we know this because we find plastics in glaciers and, and high mountain altitudes where the only way they could get there is through the air. Um, we don't actually know much about how plastics travel in the air. And we're working with the University of, uh, or sorry, York University here in Toronto to better understand how these plastics travel in the air. Remember that a lot of them are fibers that we find. So these fibers are, are long, skinny um, strings and, and you know, quite tiny, less than five millimeters, but most are, are, are less than um, 0.1 millimeters, so they're quite tiny. So they actually are quite buoyant in the air and they'll stay in the air and they'll, and they'll travel. But then of course, um, they can clump together, um, they can undergo reactions in the atmosphere just like, just like other, other um, chemicals do. Um, so they can clump together, they can fall into, onto the land or the ocean, um, or they actually can get broken down the atmosphere by light and become smaller microplastics and travel even further. Um, so yes, uh, we, we don't understand quite the proportion of how much travels into the air and how much travels via oceans and rivers. It, we really don't have an understanding of that yet, but we're trying. We're working with um, different groups to get a better understanding of this. So we can actually put microplastics into the global uh, models that we have for other particles and um, see how the microplastics differ from other particles that, which are assumed to be round sort of little balls. You, you mentioned, Lisa, that you, you sort of microplastics is relatively uh, a, a, a new line in your research. W what drove you in that direction? Oh, good question. So I'm an adjunct professor at University of Toronto and um, so it was other researchers at University of Toronto that were interested in doing microplastics in the Arctic. And they said, oh, Lisa works in the Arctic, we'll work with her to, to see what we can, if, if there's microplastics in the Canadian Arctic and, and, and what level. So it was really my partners that um, approached me and, and we were working together and, I've, and, and then Canada, of course, has taken on a role in um, especially the G7 and developing the the Canadian plastics um, agenda to really study the plastics and really take a sort of a forward-looking approach to studying plastics in the, in the environment. So that the working for the Canadian government and working for the University of Toronto um, has really come together and um, made this a, re a really interesting um, new avenue of research for me. Um, it's there's it's so interesting, um, and I. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. I hope that we answered that question completely. Um, there is another question about, you know, from the point of view of a consumer and, um, you know, how things move into the food chain. And um, is, like, can we reduce our contaminant footprint? So like when we get a takeout burger, should we ask them not to use those wrappers? Like, what are other ways like those wrappers, it's kind of free. It's, it's unbelievable. Like it's so every day, right? And is there anything we can do as, like, as consumers? Well, as consumers, um, you can have a choice of like, if you bring your container, well, now with COVID, it, it's a little bit more difficult. Say, even if you take your coffee mug to, uh, you know, to a, a coffee shop, they might not want to use your mug. Uh, but like, um, after COVID, and if it's safe enough to do, then potentially consumers can like carry your own uh, container to take out location, then ask them to put it in your container instead of uh, putting it in into some like uh, 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 packaging material. Firstly, it saves on plastics. <laughs> Uh, things that may not necessarily recycle very well. And secondly, it's also reduced the um, potential exposure to, to things like the stain repellent that we talk about that is on hamburger wrappers. So and there are many ways to do things, but like they might be a small, uh, just a small thing to change in your life, but it potentially can help the reduction of pollutants going into the environment. I really want to like expand this question for all of you. Like I'm drinking out of a glass, no more plastic bottles for me. 
how, what are there things that that you've done or that you recommend people do to reduce this contaminant footprint? Um, how how can we um, how can we be involved? So I, I, I get on the, yeah. So I was going to say on the on the mercury side, it's a little more challenging because the main areas are um, are big you know, industrial coal burning, their, um, you know, mining, smelting, that kind of thing. As a consumer, there are products that have mercury in it. And so you can be mindful of that. You can be mindful of how you dispose of the products. I think that's quite, in, quite important for mercury. So for instance, like fluorescent light bulbs have a lot of mercury in them. So make sure that you, uh, you bring your fluorescent light bulbs to a proper disposal place. Um, you, you know, if you have an bro old broken thermometer or like you've got the lights, um, the heating switches in, uh, in your house, a lot of them have a ball of, my of mercury in there. So, you know, when you take that out, don't just throw it in the garbage. Make sure you bring it to a proper recycling plant. Um, and then, I mean, I know I, I'm, this is a completely unpartisan thing to say because we're not partisan, but elect the right people who are going to do the right things. I think that's the biggest power we have is our vote. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, and it is um, like it is nonpartisan. Like, do your research, participate in your civic democracy, and raise these issues publicly with others. Um, that that's a really important point. Like, civic engagement is probably how we have our biggest voice. You you also mentioned, you know, like some consumer products and fluorescent light bulbs. How do we know if a product has mercury or pollutant? I mean, obviously like a fl if you buy Scotchgard, that's a pollutant, but I, are there things in place that help us know where, like what to buy and what not to buy? And I guess, are, does that also include those compact fluorescent light bulbs that um, Ontario Energy has been promoting do those also contain mercury? Anything that fluoresces, it's because it's the, the, the process that the chemistry happens and that's that's the fluorescence process. But it's okay. Like it's I mean, there's there's rules being put in place in terms of the mercury and products in Canada that are gonna work towards getting rid of them as much as possible. All I'm saying is dispose of them properly. Lisa, because any, there's, the, there's the dichotomy of you want to save energy. You don't want to go back to your old watt bulb. You know, the old ones that produced all that heat. You want to save energy this way. I mean, LED lights, you can use LED lights. Um, so, you know, you do have choices. Lisa, how about you? Um, for microplastics, um, we know laundering and the production of fibers through laundering is a big um is a, is a big impact on the environment. So actually wash your clothes less is, um, is a big thing. And um, if you want to go beyond that, you can also buy filters for your washing machine um, that will remove most of the, or remove a um, good majority of the, um, the microfibers coming from your washing machine. And, um, and yeah, and make sure you have the lint trap on your dryer. And, and, and of course, empty it on a regular basis. And, and is there a proper disposal for things like that? Or, you know, like for mercury, or is it still go in the garbage? It, it goes in the garbage. I know some municipalities will tell you to put your um, dryer lint into your compost. But unfortunately, that actually is just redistributed back into the environment because um, compost is... Um, they see the compost away, they put it in big rows, they, they turn it off and, and then we sell it to consumers or give it to consumers who spread it on their gardens, a very thin layer. Wind comes along, picks up the, those microplastics and, and takes them in the wind and redistributes them. So it's best to actually put them in the garbage, not to um, compost them. And since most of our fibers are actually synthetic fibers usually, um, it's better to put them in the garbage because they, they won't break down. It, cotton somewhat breaks down the environment, but the microplastics won't. Thanks. That's, those are some good tips. Um, there's a question from Eric um, who's asking about, um, yes, it's critical to have this understanding of contaminants in Canada and the Canadian Arctic. How does 
Canadian air compared with like Russian air or Scandinavian air or Alaskan air? Is that something um, y'all can speak to? That was my American y'all. Uh, like, uh, like all of us uh, work with a program called the Arctic, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. Uh, this program is actually a working group under the Arctic Council. So it advises the, um, uh, like the Arctic Council on the state of um, contaminants and climate change um, uh, like in, in, within the Arctic Circle. So all of us uh, as ex experts of the um, Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, we, other than us, like we have uh, colleagues um, in the different countries, the Arctic countries, there are eight of them, uh, that contribute our science to the Arctic Council. So from time to time, we will um, do uh, like a circumpolar assessment. So we will provide the same information about uh, persistent organic pollutants, mercury and microplastic to the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. And we'll have these big assessment reports that will summarize all the results, uh, including air, uh, water, uh, as well as the wildlife concentrations of persistent organic pollutants and mercury or plastics. And um, these uh, like uh, assessment reports are actually available online. If you go to the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program website, uh, they are free for everybody to download and so that they can see how the levels differ in the different Arctic countries. That's the Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program. Program. Uh, I Amen. will try to post that link onto the chat. So Thanks. we just recently are finishing up the Mercury AMAP assessment report. Um, and so um, we, we have very little data for in the air from Alaska, from the US. We have very, we have very little data um, anymore from Russia because that program stopped uh, probably 10, 12 years ago. So the only data that we really have in any significance is from Canada and then from our Scandinavian partners. And um, with the exception of what I'm saying is happening on the west coast of Canada, most of the trends that we're seeing, so the whether or not they're increasing or decreasing with time, most of the sites in both Canada and, um, and Scandinavia reflect a decreasing time trend. So we're very on par in that, in that sense with them, but with the exception of what hap what's happening on the west coast of Canada, and I think again, that's because we're being impacted quite significantly more so from the Asian, em Asian emissions than we are from the ones in Europe and North America. Um, Lisa, did you want to comment on, on that question or, um, I just want to say that microplastics were way behind, um, as, as Haley mentioned, AMAP, the Arctic Monitoring Assessment Program, um, I'm involved with it also for the microplastics and we're just putting a guidance document together on how to collect samples, how many samples we need. So in the future we can, um, have a, a we can develop trends. We can figure out are these things going up or are they going down? But, but we're at the very sort of preliminary stages of, of um, being able to monitor these chemicals in the Arctic in, a, in an effective way. There's some question about, and, and some, uh, Haley, you've begun to answer this about, you know, passive samplers and where they're located. And, you know, is it hard to put them up? And, you know, we're talking to people who are there. Could we... Could they help you collect data? Um, so yeah, you started to answer that, but, <laughs> but the question continues. And James asks more specifically, you know, like, can, could he help monitor microplastics through the air? How difficult is it to place these passive samplers in the high Arctic? Mm, the passive sampler for uh, persistent organic pollutants and mercury, they are now in the communities. Actually, we rely heavily on the local uh, community to help us put the samplers up because we, can't, we just can't go to all the communities all the time. And um, they are quite easy to put up, but the only um, difficulty is that like, we will have to... Um, like it, it takes some efforts to make the logistic works because like you need to um, put up a post that is not going to fall over. And then it has to be in a location where we have uh, discussed with the community that it's actually represent 
like more regionally what the contaminants is going to be like so that it's not like right next to a landfill or right next to something that is going to emit these contaminants into the air. So there is some logistic uh, that needs to be um, like it needs to be involved in collecting the samples. But otherwise, um, if the samplers, as you can see in the photographs, they are quite easy to put up. Um, but of course, there are various um, like little details that needs to be worked out. So um, for the seven communities that we currently have uh, samples out there, uh, they, are, like, they are all put up by uh, the community uh, representatives, like uh, not, not by us. So we help them, we, they help us to, to do that. Uh, as for microplastic, we'll have to talk to Lisa because I, I think she's developing a new passive sampler for microplastics. Yeah, just like everything else, the microplastics is way behind. We have a, a great passive sampler for contaminants and mercury, and we're just working on one for microplastics. We've, um, because of COVID, that's been unfortunately uh, fallen behind, but we've I've done some great work at Alert um, because we have wonderful uh, operators there and comparing high volume air samplers with um, deposition samplers with our passive air samplers. So the work is ongoing so hopefully we can have these passive samplers for microplastics and, and maybe um, in, in a few years be able to co-locate them with Haley and Sandy's samplers at the seven sites that they talked about. Thanks, thanks folks. There's some more questions but I believe we're going to turn it back to um, our host and try our best to answer those questions to, to you and, and you can share it with your group. Uh, thank you all so much for this opportunity. Oh, hey everyone, um, thank you for tuning in. Like Mark said, unfortunately, we do wanna respect the time. We do have an hour scheduled for this. Um, I know we weren't able to answer all the questions, but you can email us at research at auroracollege.nt.ca. And we are happy to connect with Sandy, Haley, Lisa and Mark and make sure that we answer any questions for you. Um, I hope everybody saw my joke in the chat. I caught Sandy off guard during her presentation. <laughs> so you, a hug is just mercury. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, when you close your web browser, you'll have a, another two question survey that just pops up asking you to rate the quality of uh, the webinar today with the sound and the video and where your feedback is greatly, greatly appreciated. And like I said, we are going to post this recording on our website and we will let everybody know via email once we've got this up online. So I am going to just quickly type the email into the chat. So like I said, if you have any questions, please feel free to email research at auroracollege.nt.ca. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Bye. 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 Thank bye, bye. You. Amanda, can you take down?